First Words, a podcast presented by the First United Methodist Church of Florence. Today's message is brought to you by Associate Pastor Rev. Dr. Terry Stubblefield. Good morning, church. I'm glad you're here. As we were coming in, not only at this service, but at 9 and at 815, We've gotten settled back into the school year, and I'm amazed at how many visitors, how many young people, and how many young families with children we have had coming the last few weeks. And we're so glad all of you are here, and I love seeing growth in our church, so we're glad you're here. What do you remember about Sunday when you were growing up? I grew up in a rural area in humble surroundings, and... On Sunday, it was all about church and family and food. My mother got up first, like she always did, and she made breakfast for her dad and for me and my brother and sister. She started lunch. She started getting everybody ready, and we put on our Sunday clothes. They were only for Sunday, shoes and clothes, and get herself ready for church. And everything we did put on hold until we got back from worship. When we were the last ones to leave the church building, because my dad was the preacher, and we came home and we changed clothes, because woe unto the child who got grass stains or food on their Sunday clothes. And then mom finished lunch, and we had a hot meal with biscuits or cornbread and a dessert. And then Sunday afternoon was for visiting grandparents or uncles and aunts, and I had cousins to see and play with. And we would stay, and then we'd drive back to the house, and we would change clothes put on our Sunday clothes and go back to church. Well, I met Deborah, a city girl in college, and I discovered that not everybody did Sunday like we did Sunday. Deborah's family ate out for lunch every Sunday. Her mother didn't cook Sunday lunch. And then they went home and took naps. (laughs) They didn't have to change clothes before lunch or after lunch. Uh, to avoid getting food on their Sunday clothes. And it was a brave new world for me and this city girl. Well, most of our Sunday customs for all of us originate from people's ideas on what you're supposed to do on Sunday. And when I use the word Sabbath, I'm talking about our Sunday now. But ever since the third commandment was given, where we read, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, we have had disagreement on why we should honor the Sabbath or Sunday. And how do we keep it holy? Exodus links the Sabbath observant with the creation. We read, in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth, the seas and everything that's in them, and he rested on the seventh day. So the Sabbath for us, for them, was to be a gift, a time of rest and relaxation, a time to meditate and think and direct your thoughts and to worship God. Jesus himself said the Sabbath was made for people and not people for the Sabbath. But then this gift of a day of rest turned into law and all kinds of rules that were associated with this commandment. What was work and what wasn't work. What you could do and what you couldn't do. What was permissible and what wasn't permissible. Keeping the Sabbath was also reserved for worshiping God. And people even had different ideas on how you worship God. What was worship? What specifically made the Sabbath or Sunday holy? Well, Jesus and the disciples were constantly getting into trouble from people who thought they knew what the Sabbath was or what the law was for not properly observing the law and the Sabbath, according to the religious authorities. They didn't get into trouble for getting their Sunday clothes sweaty or getting food on their robes or playing in the churchyard. In the Gospel of Luke, three out of four times that Jesus was questioned about the Sabbath, it was for healing somebody that was sick on the Sabbath day. In today's reading, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he sees a woman in either the synagogue or maybe out in the courts, and she was bent over, and she couldn't get up. She had been that way for 18 years, and she didn't bother Jesus. She didn't ask him for help. Jesus, as he always did, saw something he could do. He had compassion, and he went to the woman, and in the English version says, Ma'am, you are set free from your sickness. 
and he touched her. What Jesus did was to free her from the torture of her disease and gives her a new life. And she's now free from pain and shame and isolation and handicap. He gave her dignity and self-worth, her identity and her ability to function. And Jesus reached out and touched her. And that was amazing in itself because this lady may have only been able to go into the court and not into the synagogue. Many people at that time thought if you were sick or diseased or had an affliction that you were cursed by the devil or cursed by God. And so you were a social outcast. That may have been, the, that may have been what is happening. But Jesus reached out, touched her, healed her, and gave her wholeness and peace. What Jesus did was a gift. It was pure grace. And when Jesus touched her, she stands up straight for the first time in 18 years, and she begins to praise God. She knows the source of her healing. So on a Sabbath, she praises God for this unexpected, wonderful, unbelievable gift of life. Not everybody felt that way. It said the ruler of the synagogue, the man was in charge of the synagogue, could only see that Jesus had worked on the Sabbath. He had broken a rule. And he didn't confront Jesus directly, but he addressed the people in the synagogue. And he said, listen, people, there are six days you can come here and get a, get a healing. But not today. This is the Sabbath. Well, Jesus wouldn't let this go. Jesus was not ready to let this rest. He accuses the ruler of the synagogue of hypocrisy. He said, you'll let somebody give water to their ox, their donkey, their sheep but you won't let me heal somebody on the Sabbath? What is she worth? Is she worse left than an animal? So the ruler's inconsistency, a lack of understanding is revealed and the entire crowd rejoices that they've been set free. She has been set free and they've been set free from this man-made rules and regulations. It was as Jesus oftentimes did, Jesus said, you have heard or you have read, but I tell you, this is what it means. And Jesus did that again. So today, how do we keep Sunday holy? How do we worship God in the 21st century? The ways that some of us kept Sunday, those ways are gone. We can do on Sunday what you can do any day of the week. We can work. And some people have to work on Sunday. We can shop, we can fish, we can boat, we can golf, we can play sports. We can do anything on Sunday we can do in any other day of the week. We're busy. On Sunday, maybe we want to spend time with our families. Maybe we want to have some fun and some free time. And honestly, we struggle with honoring Sunday and using Sunday to rest and honor God. So what can we do on Sunday or any day of the week to make it a holy day? I read in a survey that 90% of religious people rarely or never spoke to anyone about Jesus in church. Now, we're reluctant to talk about Jesus and about church, not reluctant to talk. In our Old Testament passage today from the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is described as a young boy. Maybe he's a teenager. And he was reluctant to talk to people about God. Now, Jeremiah may have been a good Methodist, but he was shy and reluctant to talk to people about God. And God tells Jeremiah, I've got a dream for you. I've got a purpose for you. I've got a vision for you. And I want you to be a prophet. When we read, the, read that passage and we think about God wanted Jeremiah to be a prophet, but I'm not a prophet. I'm not a famous preacher or a TV preacher. Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 21, God said, all of my people are prophets. Now, when God called Jeremiah to be a prophet to the nations, we think, well, I can't go to the nations. I can't go to China or Chad or Chile or even up Cloverdale to be a prophet. The word used here for nations is ethnos, which means any group of people that doesn't know God or about Christ. And a prophet is not just somebody that tells the future. A prophet is someone who speaks for God. You can foretell, you can foretell the words of God. So we can be prophets. All of us can be prophets. We should be prophets at school, at work, even at home. Jeremiah was shy. 
but so was Isaiah and Gideon and Moses and most of us. We all have our inhibitions and excuses and reasons why we can't be God's people, why we can't be God's spokesmen, ambassadors. But God chooses all of us. God has a dream, a vision, a purpose for every one of us to make the world that we're in a better place by sharing the love of God with all people. So God can touch your spirit, your courage, your mouth so you can be God's prophet. We can be a prophet in our own family. God can touch our courage, our brains, our words. God had a dream for Jeremiah, and he has a dream for all of us. God has a vision, a plan, a divine purpose for this world and every one of us. You've read the little saying, by himself, God won't. By ourselves, we can't. But together with God, we can. So again, God has a dream for every person on this earth, every person in this house. And he calls us to help him realize that dream. God has something better in store for the world. So how do we keep the Sabbath? How do we keep Sunday holy? How do we worship God now? We can be thankful. We can be gracious. We can share our talents, our time, and God's love. We can be God's helper on earth. Let God's word come from our mouths, our speech, our life, our actions. Be God's representative on earth, wherever you are and whoever you are. Thank you for listening to First Words. For more information about our services or how to get involved in our community, visit us at fumcflorence.org or facebook.com slash florencefumc.